Thank you very much, Professor Bunaman. It's, uh, it, I never thought I would be back at UW, not because I don't like it, but I just somehow never thought it would happen. So I'm really delighted to, to be back here and to be rejoining Professor Bunaman in an exciting endeavor of building a new department, as well as, and really in some ways I should just change this now, that's going to be the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, as many of you know. And uh, of course my, my appointment is, and the chair, my endowed chair, which I was so fortunate to receive, is coming to the Center for Healthy Minds, which is a, an interdisciplinary center, but uh, I am the only humanities person so far in the center. Uh, we have, in, in fact, or I should say Richie Davidson, who founded the center, has raised the nine endowed chairs. So I'm the first, I think, to be formally installed in such a chair, but we will be growing quite a bit over the, in the coming years, and we already have a couple of other people in place now. <clears throat> the, center, the Center for Healthy Minds is focused on uh, a, a few different directions, but one of the main directions is actually trying to enhance well-being by understanding the nature of the mind through scientific means. But scientific here is used in broad terms to also include the analysis the analyses that can be provided to us by contemplative traditions. And a big part of my role at the Center for Healthy Minds is to do just that, is to work with scientists and collaborate with them so as to understand the nature of the kinds of contemplative practices that are, in, in terms of basic research, helping us to understand the nature of consciousness, for example, but also in terms of clinical research or applied research, helping us to understand why something like mindfulness might be helpful for certain types of challenged populations, persons with depression or with anxiety. Why would this kind of practice be helpful? So, as is often the case with a talk like this, and I, is it, am I too in the dark? Do we want to turn on the other light, maybe? No, it's okay. You can see the, it's true. Is it too washed out? Yes. We're the ones in the dark, but you're going to turn on. Okay, I'm going to enlighten you. Prakashi <laughs> thumb. So, as is often the case, actually, my talk sort of morphed to a certain degree, and I decided to actually bring in some of these clinical concerns into the talk, in part because I think it's really useful to see the way in which uh, work that's on South Asian traditions, in fact, can have a broader application beyond the sometimes relatively small audiences that we speak to when we give a talk at uh, even, the, even the conference here. Uh, the, the famed conference on South Asia. So what I'm going to focus on today is actually a certain aspect of the clinical efficacy of mindfulness and how we can understand that in terms of the, theor in terms of the historical and theoretical development of different styles of practice of mindfulness. And in case you're wondering, of course, mindfulness is a very important phenomenon these days. I love this cover. This is from February 2014, Time magazine which seems to suggest that if you uh, practice enough mindfulness, you will become a blonde, fair-skinned, blissful woman. <laughs> and there are a lot of uh, cultural... Uh, it hasn't worked for me yet, actually, but uh, even after 30 years, but you never know. Uh, the uh, uh, Mindfulness, of course, is a very important cultural meme, and there are ways in which it's gotten out of hand, in which that cultural meme has blossomed into something that no one really has any control over anymore and which is spinning off some of its own stories, so to speak. But there is also a good reason why mindfulness has become that way, and that's because we've discovered that it actually does seem to be effective, tentatively, it seems to be effective in a number of different contexts. Now, the research so far is actually, in some ways, really not definitive on this score. And one of the problems, which you could say is represented by this cover, the sort of hype, is that there is something of a tendency to overhype the results of research in mindfulness. And part of the reason that we're having issues around the re this research, it, one of those issues actually is something that I, isn't even on this slide, is the idea that the paradigm of that research should be what's called a randomized control trial, which is coming out of the pharmaceutical industry, really. And that, that way of approaching this type of uh, intervention actually probably is not very useful. It may not be actually that useful for drugs either, especially if you start to think about uh, gene genetically designing drugs targeted for particular kinds of populations or individuals. So the randomized control trial is one kind of obstacle that we really need to get past because mindfulness is probably really helpful for some people and maybe not all that helpful for other people, actually. But putting that aside, 
One of the big problems with mindfulness research right now is actually we don't really know what it is. We throw this term around in various ways, but we do not have very good definitions for what we mean by mindfulness. It's almost always assumed that, that mindfulness is actually one thing, that we should be able to give a single definition, that there's a single style of practice that constitutes mindfulness, and that uh, if we could just sort that out somehow, our research would be able to move forward. On top of it, Buddhist sources are frequently used as a means of trying to articulate what this particular one thing might be. You might call it authentic Buddhist mindfulness. And fortunately, these sources are generally used in a very muddled fashion. Often, and I'm sorry to say this to some people I actually know uh, who might hear this, but uh, often by people who have no training in the use of, uh, let's say, textual sources in South Asian traditions. So uh, the attempt to turn to Buddhist sources has actually caused more confusion rather than alleviate confusion. Of course, mindfulness as we know it now is, has been extracted from Buddhist sources and secularized, but it's still generally held that the Buddhist theoretical material might be helpful for understanding mindfulness. I would say that is true. The problem is the way in which we're doing it is very problematic. What we actually need, I think, are are ways of conceptualizing multiple styles of mindfulness and not asserting that there simply is one style, one authentic style that we will somehow uncover by returning to Buddhist traditions or especially to Buddhist texts. And this means that we need to parse different styles and their theories that go with them. And that's where textual study actually becomes very relevant. Looking at texts, Without the confusion, without the assumption that a text is actually going to tell you what people do, right? there's always a difference between text and practice. Nevertheless, the theoretical accounts in particular of how mindfulness is meant to operate can be very useful if we turn to them as a way of understanding multiple styles and not a single style. And then, of course, another tack, which is not textual, is to look at the actual phenomenology of mindfulness practice. What is it like to practice mindfulness? What occurs in the experience of practitioners when they engage in, again, different styles of practice? So I should say that as a point of clarification, when I talk about mindfulness here, I'm talking about what you can call formal meditation practice. And here I'm actually thinking of a term that the Tibetans developed, but that is implicit in Indian sources. And this would be in the compound Nyam Jie in Tibetan, which means Nyam Shak and Jie To. It, uh, the namshak would literally in Sanskrit would be the samapti state. And it's just a generic way of referring to the formal meditative state. The jetop, it would be the, the tatprashta labda, the subsequent state. So it's very important to keep track of the fact that practices, the meditation practices concern both the actual moment of formal meditation practice and what is done in between practice, in between formal meditations. Right in the so-called between-session time. So both of those are very relevant to contemplative training. They're also relevant to the theoretical models that are applied or that attempt to explain what's happening in contemplative training. Nevertheless, I'm just going to be focusing right now on, strictly on the formal meditative state, what in the Tibetan would be called the nyamsha. Now, what uh, occurs between sessions, of course, is, uh, is crucially important, but it, it's, it, we need to remember that it is very distinct from what happens in the formal state, especially at the beginning. Now, all of this is coming out of, when we talk about mindfulness, especially in clinical context, the main source of the styles of mindfulness that you will fi applied, uh, find applied in clinical context for various kinds of populations are generally coming from the style developed by John Kabat-Zinn, uh, and this is in the book Full Catastrophe Living, which actually appears several years later in 1999, several years after the development of what he calls mindfulness-based stress reduction, which he developed with uh, various other colleagues, especially Sanki Santarelli at the U uh, University of Massachusetts Medical School, initially in the chronic pain clinic, actually. So mindfulness-based stress reduction is the paradigmatic style of what we call a mindfulness-based intervention, which draws primarily on Buddhist sources, but also on other sources, interestingly, not just Buddhist sources, for the development of the contemplative style that we know as mindfulness. Now, in clinical context. Now, according to John Kabat-Zinn, there are seven features that characterize mindfulness. Mindfulness. 
non-judging, patience, beginner's mind, trust, non-striving, acceptance, and letting go. And anyone who's already familiar with Buddhist traditions will know that this list doesn't look particularly traditional if you're thinking that mindfulness is emerging from Theravada practice. So if you think that mindfulness means, vipass- for example, what we think of as contemporary vipassana practice, then, and you look at this list, you might be a little bit confused. You probably have not heard of beginner's mind in the vipassana world. You also, the idea of letting go might be there. Non-judging, of course, you will find in contemporary vipassana practice. But if you go back just a little bit, and especially if you go back to original texts, The idea of non-judging is extremely problematic from the standpoint of Theravada practice. However, if you do not assume that these ideas are emerging primarily from the Theravada uh, style, but instead are emerging from some other sources, then it's much easier to recognize them. Because these are actually, especially beginner's mind, for example, is a term straight out of Zen. Uh, non-judging, letting go, acceptance, non-striving. These are all characteristics of both Zen practice and actually John Kabat-Zinn's initial, for, initial exposure to con- contemplative practice of this, in this style was in Korean Zen or Sion. And also coming from Mahamudra and Dzogchen practice in the Tibetan context, somewhat later. So the, when we see these seven and recognize them, as a way of unpacking this famous quote from 1994 by John Kabat-Zinn, that mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally, that these various features, as a way of unpacking this, make sense when we think of it as connecting to certain Buddhist traditions, but not to other Buddhist traditions. And part of what I'm going to try to do today is explain a little bit of that distinction between these styles of practice. But first, let's think about some of the main critiques of MBSR. One of them is simply that it's not authentic. Often you'll hear that MBSR is described as watered-down Buddhism. Of course, it's not meant to be Buddhism. It's supposed to be secularized. But this critique will then sometimes be applied even to uh, mindfulness in contemporary American Buddhist context, that somehow it's a watered-down version of authentic Buddhist practice. And authentic Buddhist mindfulness instead of the notion of not making any judgments while you are practicing requires one to make judgments, especially ethically charged judgments about one's mental states. You need to recognize if you are having a negative or akushala, an unskillful, a, an ethically negative mental state, or an ethically positive mental state. So this critique uh, is assuming that the style of practice that you're engaged in requires you to make judgments, actually. Authentic Buddhist mindfulness also requires one to see see things as they truly are, which has only one interpretation of Buddhism, according to these critics. Right? Well, one of these critics who's best known is Alan Wallace, and he is one of the first to get this ball rolling, actually, really in the 90s, but this this is a quote from his 2006 book. And as you can see, what he's claiming is that there is something that there are modern descriptions of mindfulness, and they're certainly valuable. People have benefited. But this doesn't take away from the fact that the modern understanding departs significantly from the Buddha's own account of sati and from the most authoritative commentators in the Theravada and Indian Mahayana traditions. And this is what uh, Alan Wallace will say in his book, Attention Revolution. We also then find a very similar uh, statement coming from uh, uh, Shonen Van Gordon and Griffiths in 2014, another set of critics, and there are now many critics of, of mindfulness-based stress reduction. In fact, we now speak somewhat of a mindfulness backlash. And they say the term non-judgmental could also imply that the mindfulness practitioner does not seek to discern which cognitive, emotional, and behavioral responses are conducive to the upholding of ethical commitments and to spiritual development in general. This would obviously be inconsistent with the Buddhist perspective, they say. And then finally we have Ron Purser in 2015 saying in a Buddhist context, seeing things as they truly are, which he's referred to in a previous sentence, refers to the penetrating insight into the three characteristics and a complete dissolution of the observer-observed dichotomy. Right? So here you have three critics. One critic is basically saying this stuff is inauthentic because it doesn't include judgment. Another set of critics is especially focusing on this issue of judgment. And a third critic is saying, when you're engaged in mindfulness, 
You need to see things as they truly are. And what that means is the dissolution of the subject-object dichotomy and seeing what are called the three marks, which means uh, suffering, impermanence, and selflessness. Okay, so these are what are critic. They're saying mindfulness-based stress reduction doesn't do any of that. So it's inauthentic, watered-down Buddhism. Well, they're not really right, actually, because all of these critics are focused on a style of mindfulness that is emerging from a different stream of Buddhist practice. Right? We do not know, first of all, what the Buddha said. And Buddhist traditions are not unitary. There are multiple streams. Their texts do not al always align with actual practice. So what something said, if a text says one thing, that doesn't mean that practitioners actually engage in that text. And hence, the whole notion of authentic Buddhist mindfulness does not make sense. So that's a response to, to Alan Wallace's critique that somehow there's an authentic version that the Buddha himself stated. From the standpoint of the academic study of religion, that's an incredibly problematic claim. But more importantly, regardless of whether, of, of course, we, if we know something about the Buddhist tradition, we know that the Buddhists basically said whatever people needed to hear. So he'll say one thing to one person and another thing to another person, according to the tradition, according to the later tradition. And indeed, we have attributed to the Buddha multiple versions of mindfulness, not a single version. Right? Secondly, among those multiple versions, some practice styles explicitly suspend ethical judgment during formal practice. If you are engaged in an ethical judgment, for example, in the style of practice that these critics are focused upon, if I have a moment of anger, I need to recognize that anger is a klesa in, in Pali or klesha in Sanskrit. I need to recognize that it is unwholesome, that it is ethically negative. If I don't engage in that judgment, I am not doing my mindfulness practice correctly. In contrast, if I am engaged in a non-dual style of practice, such as the style of practice we find in India in the Mahamudra tradition, when I'm cultivating something that we can perhaps call mindfulness, at that point, if I engage in an ethical judgment, I am not doing the practice properly. Right? So they have very distinct attitudes toward ethical judgment, these different styles of practice. And seeing things as they truly are actually occurs in various distinct ways. And one of the ironic things about Ron Purser's quote is that he combines two different styles that are completely distinct. He says you need to know the three marks and you need to have the subject-object relationship dissolve. Well, actually, those can happen together in any tradition. That's, they don't come together in any tradition. Those are distinct traditions. If you're talking about the dissolution of the subject-object relationship, you're no longer talking about the three marks. And finally, MBSR is actually close, much closer to what I would call non-dual styles, but most of the critiques, the ones that we just saw, and many others right now, are coming from what I would call classical styles. So the main problem here is a confusion about the different varieties of mindfulness. And the critics are coming from a position in which they are not distinguishing these different styles. Now this is a paper that appeared in a volume called The Handbook of Mindfulness and Self-Regulation. This is not the kind of volume, if you asked me 10 years ago, that I would be getting a publication in, but uh, these days you never know what's going to happen. Um, uh, and that's available from Springer. Uh, I believe we have it at the library, but you can also download this from my website. Uh, this is actually, a, a part of my talk today is going to be focusing upon uh, the, this, the presentation of two distinct styles of mindfulness in a heuristic way. I'm going to, I group different styles of practice together into what I call the non-dual and the classical. And if you want to go into greater depth uh, uh, in terms of th that division, that heuristic division, then I recommend this article. But I also want to mention this article. This is, uh, a, a, as Professor Budeman said, this is one of my more recent publications. This came out in the fall. This also came out in the fall. This is actually a collaborative piece that was written with three scientists that attempts to develop a phenomenology of mindfulness to look at the multiple vari multiple versions of mindfulness. And this appeared in the American Psychologist. And then to connect hypothetically some of those uh, different styles of mindfulness and features of mindfulness with possible um, uh, brain uh, networks. And this is the, uh, the wonderful diagram that comes out in the paper. We call the paper the cube paper for that reason. Uh, not to be confused with the terrible 1990s film. 
uh, the cube. Uh, so I hope none of you have seen it. Um, <laughs> So as you can see, what we talk about in this paper are seven different dimensions that are inspired somewhat by Buddhist theoretical material, but not entirely. And I want to talk about one dimension in particular here today, dereification. Because as it turns out, if it were the case, just suppose that what we wanted mindfulness to be is to reflect perfectly the classical style. In other words, the style that we find articulated in the Pali canon and in the text of the Theravada tradition, we would no longer be able to talk about dereification. But dereification, as it turns out, is one of the most important features of mindfulness in clinical terms. It's, of course, also crucial to non-dual practice, but dereification is simply impossible from the standpoint of classical practice. So I'm going to explain what that dereification is. This, by the way, diagram is marking different styles of practice. I don't have enough time to really get into this, so I'm not going to uh, go through it. But basically, dereification is one of the main dimensions that we think is manipulated by different styles of practice. So what is dereification? Well, you're all eating samosas, so this isn't the best time to do this. But if you hadn't eaten yet, then I would be able to ask you to visualize. And I, I, I like talking about dereification because it lets me do this little exercise, which is so much fun. I'd like you to visualize a beautiful bowl of strawberries, freshly washed, glistening in the sun, organic, there's that smell coming off of them, maybe a little sugar, some beautiful melted chocolate nearby. There, is anyone's mouth watering? Yes, mouth watering. Isn't that, so that's amazing, isn't it? There it is, there they are. Right? So your mouth, by thinking, even without seeing the image, just by thinking, you can make your mouth water. Right? So that's a property of the human mind, and probably other mammals as well, which is very important in clinical context. Because you can also, by thinking, you can also make yourself experience a, a stress response. And here's Robert Sapolsky, and this is actually uh, in a conversation with His Holiness Dalai Lama. He's describing this kind of stress response. The central concept of the study of stress is this. If you are a zebra and a lion leaps out and rips your flesh open and you are in pain, running for your life, the things your body does then are wonderful. They are exactly what you need in order to survive. But if you are a human suffering from adventitious pain, your body, which... He connects then to the notion of the second arrow in the Salata Sutta. If you are a human suffering from adventitious pain, your body does exactly the same thing. And if it does that for a long time, disease will arise. So, for example, if you start to think now about, let's say, some difficult exam that you're facing if you're a student, or the big mound of papers that you have to correct, or the financial difficulties that you're confronting, or the difficult conversation that you're going to have to have tomorrow with your boss or with your spouse or whomever it might be. As you think about that, some future event or some past trauma, you actually start to enact it in your body. And there's a theory both in the Buddhist context, uh, connected to concept formation, and also in cognitive science, connected to what's called grounded cognition, that helps us to understand that basically, <coughs> thinking in this fashion is like an embodied simulation. So, just as simply by thinking of strawberries, you can make your mouth water, so too, by thinking of a difficult situation, you can have a stress response. And that stress, or stress response prepares you to be wounded, which means that it's going to flood your system with, with for example, <laughs> pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, and it's, those, over time, wear down your system. The more you have them, if you constantly have those kinds of inflammatory cytokines and other, uh, uh, other infl inflammation promoting hormones in your body, then you are in trouble, basically, in the long term. At least that's what the current research seems to suggest. Ooh! <laughs> it's that moment of thinking about something terrible that can simply produce this kind of stress response. Now, 
When you, another way of thinking, I just want to, all right, I added these slides today. This is another, I love this sequence. One of my students in a seminar on mindfulness I'm teaching this semester sent these to me. This is also a very good example of this kind of thing that we're all very familiar with. You're walking down the street, you suddenly think it's that, that embarrassing thing you did eight years ago, that terrible moment of embarrassment, right? We all probably have one of these, that terrible, we think of something that, oh, gee, I wish I hadn't done that. And then, we continue walking, but now we feel this way. So the power of that thought actually can change our mood, but also it changes our body. And in certain clinical contexts, like uh, depression and anxiety, this way of thinking, getting caught in scripts, getting caught, you could say, in a story about yourself, for example, seems to be a powerful aspect of the psychopathology. It's powerful powerful uh, driver of depression and anxiety, it would seem. Now, one of the ways I talk about this uh, idea of derification is I mentioned the story of my friend Togme, a Tibetan man. When he first came to the United States, he, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, at a, a UVA as a librarian. And uh, the students there, on his first or second day of, of work, invited him to go to see a movie and have a pizza. So they took him out to Jurassic Park. The first Jurassic Park was just appearing at that time. And uh, as they uh, um, were in the movie, at a certain point, Togbe, whom I had known in India for a long time, and who had never seen a computer graphic film before, began to scream. And then he kept screaming. It wasn't like he was one of these people who just likes to scream in scary movies. <laughs> he was terrified because he thought it was real. Right? Right? So as the dinosaurs were doing their thing, Tokme thinks, this is, you know, CNN. I'm watching an actual newsreel of someone getting themselves devoured by a dinosaur. But finally they told him, no, it's all been generated by a computer. This is not reality. This is just an illusion. He was able to stop screaming. He was able to enjoy the illusion and even be a little frightened and so on. But he was no longer terrified in the same way. So this is exactly dereification. It's that moment of seeing through the embodied simulation that is the thinking that we are engaged in in the moment. And to recognize that the strawberries that you imagine cannot be eaten. Right? Another way I like to illustrate this is with this famous painting. Some of you know it, so don't, uh, don't, don't spill the beans. But if I ask you, what is this? You say, what is it? Not a pipe. Ah, no, you ruined it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right? So most people, you say, this is a pipe, right? But of course, this is Marguerite's famous painting, which says, this is, in the beep. this is not a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's the reification. My idea of the exam, my idea of the difficult, the difficult conversation, my idea of strawberries are just ideas. They're not the reality. That seems to be very powerful, very important in clinical context. Now, given the importance of dereification in clinical context, you would think that if we're going to try to understand how it works in the context of mindfulness, and we're going to look, go back to Buddhist texts, uh, we would hope to find it in those Buddhist texts that are supposed to be providing us with the authentic version of mindfulness. But, the, but actually, when we look at these two we can look at two different versions, classical and non-dual, and we'll find out that only one of them supports this idea of dereification. And in the other, the notion of dereification is impossible. So in classical, and this would include basically the styles of practice that are emerging from the Abhidharma, the Buddhist Abhidharma, and you can look at the paper I mentioned previously for details. The basic problem is Atmakraha, self-grasping, the solution is to realize selflessness. So this is going to be what, they, what you can call the pratipaksha model, the model in which you apply an antidote to a problem. The solution to anger, for example, is cultivating love. The solution to the fundamental confusion driving suffering, which is self-grasping, is to realize selflessness, that there's nothing to grasp at, so to speak. How do you engage in this? What is the path, so to speak? You learn an exhaustive typology of the mind, body, and world. This is the Abhidharma typology of the dharmas. Fairly consistent. There are different a n numbered lists, but actually on the core, the core material is really pretty consistent across the traditions. You develop a stable, intense focus on objects. 
which then enables you to apply that list in a, an analysis as you systematically look through the constituents of the mind and body to determine where is the self. To determine whether there is something here that could be a candidate for the kind of self that we believe we have. Now, this approach is the classical approach. Yeah, the non-dual approach says that the basic problem is actually dualistic awareness. There's a shift in the definition of what causes suffering. Now it is actually the standpoint of a subjectivity, or a grahaka, standing over against an, an apprehended object, or a grahya. So this, in what in the Western phenomenological tradition would be called intentionality, the subject-object duality, the subject-object relationship, <coughs> that actually is the fundamental cause of suffering. In Dharmakirti's work, and uh, as uh, Professor Budiman mentioned, I've worked uh, quite a bit on Dharmakirti, he formulates this very nicely by referring to it as the antrupa the internal distortion. So this internal distortion, which makes us feel as if we are subjects apprehending objects, is the fundamental cause of suffering for the later yoga Chara tradition, that is, as it is known, which is the source of all Buddhist non-dual traditions. How do you solve it? Well, you cultivate... Really, it's also the Pratipaksha uh, model. You're going to have an antidote, the Pratipaksha. What's the antidote here? The antidote here is non-dual awareness. Right? So you discover that the duality in your awareness is actually a false, in, is a, a false imprint, if you like, and that uh, the reality of the nature of your awareness is actually non-dual. What's the path? You need to suspend conceptuality. That's the first part of it, a key in this style of contemplative practice, because based upon the way in which they theorize concept formation, if you are thinking, you are necessarily dualistic. So all forms of vikalpa, and then the term vikalpa, which is conceptuality here, later simply also means being in the state of subject-object duality, not just thinking, any kind of any kind of intentional state, any state with a subject-object structure is going to be understood to be a concept. But even setting that aside, our ordinary use of the word concept, where we're having thoughts, always involves a dualistic structure, according to this tradition, or really traditions. So what you need to do, first of all, as a beginner, is to suspend conceptuality. Find a way of not being involved in conceptuality, because that is our initial main obstacle to... Uh, realizing, as they would put it, non-dual awareness. Then secondly, you have to enhance a certain aspect that already exists in your cognitive capacities that they call reflexivity. That's the subject of an entire another talk. I'm not going to get into the detail, but it basically is a pre-existing capacity in all conscious beings, they would claim, that enables them to uh, already know, already have an aspect of their awareness which is non-dual. And then you use a technique, the most common technique here is something that's called in the Lanka Avatara Sutra, it's called the Four Yogas. This is not to be confused with the Four <coughs> Yogas that emerged later in the Mahamudra tradition. And these Four Yogas begin with a very key step, which is called the recognition that phenomenal appearances are the mind. The Pratipasa are nothing other than Chitta. Or in Tibetan, some of you will recognize the phrase Nangwa Semsung Ngotra to recognize appearances as the mind. So that's the first of these four yogas that are critical to developing non-dual awareness. Now, what is needed when we, if we go back to this idea of dereification, which we observe to be present in, in contemporary mindfulness practice, in certain styles, it seems that all styles kind of flirt with it a little bit, but some really emphasize it, especially the style developed by John Kabat-Zinn. What do you need to have in place in order to engage in this kind of dereification? Well, first of all, you have to recognize phenomenal appearances as mind. So that should be familiar. That's exactly the first of the four yogas, right? Dereification is exactly this step, with one small proviso. Uh, when we recognize phenomenal appearances as mind, it doesn't just mean your thoughts. So the term, the Sanskrit term pratipasa, or nangwa in Tibetan, refers not just to the kinds of images that are presented when you are thinking, it also refers to the kinds of images that are presented in your perception. Right? So this move is something like 
When we have this idea in place, we're really talking about something like a phenomenological reduction in the Western phenomenological tradition. It's the capacity to bracket, to use that language, to bracket what's called the natural attitude, which is the sense that all that is appearing to you right now is out there. All of your sensory appearances are out there, and even that concepts appear to be over there. So that out thereness or over thereness, even of our thoughts, but especially of our sensory experiences, that all needs to be bracketed and seems to be within the field of consciousness. So that's what this move means. It means to see not just your thoughts, but even if I hold up something with a little higher contrast, maybe this is good, even this visual object on this account is not out there. It's actually within your consciousness. Now, a simple way we can do that, putting aside uh, Buddhist arguments, is of course if we want to play brain, brain scientist and use neurospeak, we say that there, your, your visual system through the retina interacts with the photons bouncing off of this at a certain frequency, fre- well, multiple frequencies. They stimulate your visual cortex back here in the back of your brain and gradually somehow or another in a way that nobody really understands eventually you somehow actually see something for example you see the color black but that color doesn't exist in the world what exists in the world on that account are photons right the color itself doesn't exist out there so where does the color exist the color is a product of your visual systems interpretation of its interaction with the environment. So that color exists only in your consciousness. Color is the way that your consciousness represents your environment, but colors do not exist in the world. On this account, we we would say that photons exist. On the Buddhist account, there'd be another way of explaining it that we won't go into because it'll be too confusing for right now. There's a cause, there's some kind of cause, and the properties of that cause are represented as color. But colors don't exist in the world. So part of what this means, in order for you to do that kind of phenomenological reduction, in order for you to do uh, uh, in, uh, this, to see the pratibhasa as actually just your mind, to do what we just described, and to experience this actually as in your mind, as a part of your mind, not as an object out there, in order to do that, you have to have a representational account of consciousness. And very briefly, just to represent a model, here's the eye faculty. Here, uh, this box represents consciousness itself. An object interacts with the eye faculty, such as to create an image in consciousness. Now, when we speak in these terms, in the Buddhist world, we call this the phenomenal form of the object, the grahya akara. And simultaneously arising with it is what we call the grahaka akara, the, uh, the form of this phenomenal form of the subject. So as I behold this visual object, there is a representation of the object in my consciousness, and there's also a sense of myself as the knower being represented at the same time, okay, simultaneously. So there's a phenomenal form of the object and a phenomenal form of the subject. That is what we mean by a representational account of consciousness. Okay? This representational account of consciousness is absent in the classical account. There's no representational account of consciousness. So you can't talk in this way. You can't talk about a phenomenological reduction. You can't talk about seeing appearances as your mind. And therefore, you also can't talk about seeing thoughts as just mind. And part of the reason for that is that along with this representational account of consciousness in general which would include sensory experience, you also get a representational account of thoughts. But more properly speaking, we can call this an eidetic account, an account in which thoughts are understood to involve phenomenal images, or uh, akara or pratibhasa, both of them will work, or even pratibhasa. (coughs) Now, what does that mean? Very briefly... I'm running out of time, so I'll just go through very briefly. This is our same model, but now we're talking about different moments in time going down. So the object interacts with the senses to create an image, a sense of the object, a phenomenal form of the object, a phenomenal form of the subject, and the second moment, and then in the third moment or some subsequent moment, it's conceptualized. Now, this moment of conceptualization, like, oh, that's blue, 
And on this theory, by the way, it's at this point that volitional action becomes possible when you conceptualize it. So, uh, and this is just a particular case of thought, which is a thought that we call a perceptual judgment. You're recognizing something as a bottle or as black and so on. So at this moment of conceptualization, as you can see that in the diagram here, the concept includes some kind of a content, a phenomenal content. There's an image that goes with it. So far, if I, if I say, for example, to you, horse, if I say, think of a horse, the claim on this kind of model of uh, concept formation is that when you think of a horse, you have some vague, it actually it's said to be vague always, you have some aspashta, some vague content that occurs with the thought. And that vague content is actually a phenomenal appearance. Now, if we want to say, when you think of a horse, that's not actually a horse, or when you think of a strawberry, that's not actually a strawberry, part of the meditation instruction, the contemplative instruction there, is that there is something for you to observe, which is you could observe the phenomenal content that is being associated with the concept. So it's not that you have an intellectual operation, it's rather that you actually observe the phenomenal content in that moment of thought and see that that phenomenal content is nothing other than your own mind. All right? So that's the reification. That's this clinically, critically important moment in, uh, in, um, in the clinical application of mindfulness. And it is also absent in the classical account. It's not absent because they didn't think of it. It's absent because it's impossible. You can't actually articulate a contemplative practice using the theoretical materials from the classical account. Now, there's a lot more I could say, uh, and I think I should probably stop because Professor Bunemann needs to leave in any case. Um, but let me just do this really quickly. <laughs> in classical practice, classical means there, there are actually going to be multiple styles of practice that we can call classical. Remember, this is a heuristic coming out of the Abhidharma style. Concepts must be used at so as to properly identify the ethical, ethical quality of mental states. That's part of what you're doing. You're trying to identify which kind of mental state do you have. And it's very important to know the ethical valence of the state. Since concept formation necessarily involves duality, non-dual contemplative practices require the suspension of concept formation. We already went through that, why that's necessary. So ethical judgments in particular are an especially sticky case of concept formation which means that it's especially important to suspend ethical judgments. I, uh, there are some interesting reflections one might engage in around this idea that ethical judgments are especially sticky, so to speak. This is a term that we started using at the lab, which is actually sort of a play on words with klesha, which literally, in a way, can mean sticky. But part of it is also that and I think Emile Durkheim actually is an interesting place to turn here. The way in which uh, our ethical judgments are caught up in our construction of reality seems quite profound. In other words, that ethics and ethical judgments are in, in some sense seen as constitutive of our realities, even if they are actually culturally uh, determined. So I'll, I'll set that aside for the moment and just go to some conclusions. So first of all, contemporary mindfulness draws primarily on non-dual styles. So when we think of contemporary mindfulness as being primarily the style of mindfulness developed by John Kabat-Zinn, then really we're talking about non-dual styles, not classical styles, as the main source. But of course, like almost everything in our modern world, or our late modern, or postmodern, or whatever it is, world, it's hybrid, right? It's, it's really neither one nor the other. It's both classical and non-dual. But its main influences are non-dual. It's important to remember that hybridity, though. It's what in, I love the Tibetan word, Rama Luk, which means neither, neither sheep nor goat. Right? So it's neither sheep nor, go nor goat. So only non-dual styles provide the resources for dereification, which is itself crucial in clinical context. So when we're criticizing contemporary mindfulness by taking a stance coming out of classical approaches, part of what we're doing is that we're actually 
eliminating a whole set of theoretical approaches that enable us to understand a critical feature of mindfulness in clinical contexts. And finally, judgments, including especially ethical judgments, must be suspended for dereification to work. Because, of course, if you're engaged in judgment, you're caught in the dualistic stance, the strawberry is indeed a strawberry. It's not just a mental appearance, and dereification has been blocked. If that means, of course, if my, let's say, in my context, I, I have a form of depression that involves, as it often does, a lot of self-focus and a lot of uh, negative self-image, then my thought, I am a loser, I will simply take to be real. That's true. I am a loser. So the capacity to de-reify that thought requires me to suspend the habit of judgment. Well, that's it for now. Uh, thank you very much. If there are any questions, I have to take them.